So I'd like to talk to you tonight about one environment that is very interesting to me. It ends up being quite extreme, as hopefully I'll convince you over the next few minutes, and that is the environment of Mars. So a few years ago, we all got excited about this, right? Because this movie came out and it, st it starred Matt Damon. Oh, this was fabulous. So with all due credit to 20th Century Fox, thank you very much for putting together such a, a wonderful expression of Andy Weir's um, excellent book. So I'm gonna challenge you that I believe there are at least three choices that Andy Weir made in his book and in the movie that actually make the entire plot of the movie untenable. And so we'll see if you can come up with what those three possibilities might be. But nevertheless, Mars is in fact something that is near and dear to all of our heart, right? But we have to start with this because every time an astronaut comes in and talks, they have to do this and show you pictures of the Earth. So of course, when we see things that are blue, well, that, that must be water. And when we see things that are sort of gray, that's probably buildings. And we see things that are green and that must be either vegetation and brown, of course, is dirt. So the question is, where are we looking on the earth right now? Indeed we are, yes. Yeah. So in fact, you are right about, uh, I'd say right about here right now, a little bit over this way. So I think this is the uh, Kingston Cemetery right here. So this is the main channel. There's Gosport right there. This was shot from the ISS in 2001. So I believe the, the sub base is still active. I think you can see a few docked along over here. And uh, quite a spectacular view from the ISS. Mike, I'll send you a copy of this. I'm sure you'll want that, yeah. But isn't this the view that we want instead? And so this is really the question that I'm posing to the group today. What will it take to be the first person on Mars? So, and if this seems like the stuff of speculation or perhaps just idle dreaming, I want to assure you that in fact it's not. So if you were born after the year 1995, please raise your hand. Okay, so we have a few of you out here. So you are approximately Generation Z, or I'm sorry, I'm on the other side of the ocean, Generation Z. And what is it that's so special about Generation Z? Well, there's been all kinds of things that have said about you, but not enough people are saying that in fact, you are the spacefaring generation. Why do I believe that? Well, a couple different reasons. If you think just during the 21st century alone, we have always had humans in space. Always had since November of 2000, there have been humans continuously inhabiting the International Space Station. That's quite amazing. So for some of you, your entire life, you have had humans in space. And over that same time period, we have always been at the planet Mars. We are there robotically right now. We are on the surface, we are around the surface, and we are doing the preparatory work to be ready to send humans to Mars in probably the 2030-ish time frame. The thing that we lack really at this point is just the political will to do it. But will it be easy? No, and in fact, I would contend that physiological challenges are going to be one of the greatest hurdles that we must surmount over this time. So how is this going to happen? Well, for those of you that pay a little bit of attention to spaceflight, what you'll see is that since about March in the United States, things have gotten pretty, pretty dynamic in the space business. It was in March, March 17th, I believe, that Vice President Pence announced to the American public and said that the United States would be returning to the moon by the year 2024. And I will let you know that this is going to happen and in fact, we're cutting the hardware already and that hardware is being assembled. Now, going back to the moon, perhaps is, sounds like a little bit of a misdirection on the way to Mars, but hopefully I will convince you that in fact, the moon is the perfect training ground for planetary exploration. And that we'll be looking at that 2030-ish timeframe as we've put all the pieces in place to then invoke them for Martian, uh, um, orbital operations, and then ultimately Martian uh, surface operations. So in fact, this is, this is Mars and the moon 
or as our administration tends to refer to it now as the M&M effort. So this is not Smarties on the other side of the pond. This is M&Ms, Mars and Moon. So what will this take? It's really moving from this idea of Earth reliance in low Earth orbit. We communicate pretty constantly with the ground, in fact, with the International Space Station. We pretty much have about 90% coverage with the ground for any particular orbit. To moving into this proving ground, it will be in cis lunar space, the area around the moon, and ultimately working quite independently as we get out to Mars. Why do we need to work independently? Because it would be a very boring conversation if I spoke to you, you heard me 22 minutes later, and then you responded to me and I waited another 22 minutes for your reply. That, in fact, is what we're faced with for the communications challenges with Mars. So this is really a, a different kind of step moving to autonomous planetary exploration. How will we do it? Busy, busy time in spaceflight. Rockets going up all over the place. So let's review some of the rockets that uh, are coming along as we see. So of the rockets that are sitting here, can anybody tell me how many are currently flying? Which ones are currently flying? Nobody. We can grow people to space, but I mean, the Falcon, the heavy, and the new Glenn is up there. So, so, all right, so you've earned yourself one patch <laughs> for one out of two correct answers. So that's a patch from my mission, and that's how I make sure that my name is spelled correctly. <laughs> So indeed, it is the Falcon by SpaceX is the one that is flying right now. New Glenn is actually not flying, but the hardware is being built at this point. So there's New Shepard, its predecessor, that is flying. Next year, we will see this guy, the Space Launch System. This is shuttle-derived technology. The tanks are built. The rocket is approximately 70% assembled right now. Assembly complete should be later on this year. And this will be launching the Orion capsule, which will be capable of putting up four-person crews powered by a European-supplied service module, which has already been delivered. Now, this is actually a, a really important moment in spaceflight, because up to this time, the United States has never put another entity in the critical path for development. We've always made sure that we can launch our vehicles. So, but... Because of the European Supplied Service Module, we put ESA in the critical path. This is true partnership that we're seeing on an international level right now. And the Europe Europeans have delivered beautifully on this. So, so government supplied vehicle, private vehicle. This is developed by Jeff Bezos. So we have billionaires competing for, for a low Earth orbit. Um, at the same time, we have sort of the traditional space companies. So Boeing with the United Launch Al uh, Alliance is producing the CST-100, and this is an Atlas-derived vehicle. And then we have some interesting things that are going on in Atlas as well, a small space plane, if you will, by Sierra Nevada. That should be going up in about a year. This will be in a cargo form initially and will be capable of converting over to human flight. And then we have Orbital Sciences Cygnus vehicle, which is also a flying vehicle at this point. So lots of different opportunities here. Where are they going? Well, right now they're going to the International Space Station. And this is the International Space Station as it sits today. It is, in fact, our orbital laboratory. And quite a laboratory it is. So it's been in construction for about 12 years as we look at this. And so it has been constructed to put now about 450 tons of hardware in low Earth orbit. It is the largest and most expensive single construction project that has ever been undertaken. Um, it orbits the Earth every 90 minutes right now at an altitude of approximately 250 miles and uh, provides a permanent crew of seven people right now. So let me just move that along. That's what it looks like right now. 
So I'm gonna encourage you to do something because there's an incredible opportunity that has emerged for the Portsmouth community and it will be tomorrow morning. At 5.20 a.m., you will have the most superb pass of the International Space Station that you could ever hope for. It is the best pass of the summer. It will launch almost exactly, uh, or you'll be able to see it, due west, come in due east. I think I got those right around here, I'm about, I'm about right. And it'll be about six minutes from horizon to horizon. It will pass almost directly overhead at the 87 degrees at the highest point. So don't be late. 5.20 a.m. I believe is, is, is when you lift off and 5.26 is when it will be setting. Don't bother with your telescopes. Your tracking systems aren't fast enough to track it the way it's moving across the sky. What you'll see is a fairly bright trail, a bright star if you will, and it'll emerge a little bit dim and it'll get brighter and brighter as it goes overhead and sets. If you bring along a good set of field glasses, you'll be able to pick out some of those solar arrays altogether. This is about the typical size of an American football field. So quite an accomplishment. And of course, this is our laboratory for the future. But then as we move into this next phase called Artemis, this is where we'll head to the lunar south pole by 2024. Now, those of you that are into your mythology will recognize the name Artemis. Artemis was the twin sister of Apollo in mythology. And this is important and has special significance because our government has made it very clear that the Artemis program will land the first woman and the next man on the lunar surface. That is a commitment to the world right now. And it's high time that it's happened. And so initially 2024, that will be a relatively short foray. By the time we hit 2028, we will be staying up for 60 to 70 days at a time at the lunar south pole. Why the lunar south pole? It's a fascinating place because there are craters at the lunar south pole that we have just reported, determined last year with a more careful analysis of existing lunar reconnaissance orbiter data that water ice exists mixed in the regolith of the lunar south pole. We have water at the lunar poles. And the reason it stays there is because the poles stay in permanent shadow, some of the craters. And so in those areas, we always get excited. We always get excited about water because certainly we've learned from NASA's astrobiology program that anywhere on this planet where we find water, be it the most inhospitable environments, we find life life figures out a way to happen. So water on other planets is essentially intriguing. It is also a resource that we can use, and I'll show you a little bit about how that works. So Artemis does a lot of things that Apollo did not. It will be the first time that we will use solar electric power for a human vehicle. We've used it for some smaller vehicles up to this point and the landers will be supplied through commercial partnerships. And now we're putting commercial entities in the critical path as well. So it's a rapidly, rapidly evolving program. As I said, the space launch system has been built. The European service module has been delivered. The contracts for this vehicle have already been let and the competition for the landers is about to begin. This is moving at an extremely fast track. I was at the National Space Council meeting about two weeks ago, and Vice President Pence was absolutely clear that this is going to happen in a strong commitment from the US administration. It's very exciting. Phase two then uses a key element of the Artemis program that we've never done before in space. So essentially what we did when we went to Apollo is we built one rocket. We put a lander on it, we put a crew on it, we launched them all together, and then we sent the lander down, and then it came back to the capsule, and we went back home, right? Footprints and flags, and we're done. Artemis will not look like that at all. What Artemis will do, will create a very small space station, actually a little smaller than this configuration, and it'll put it in a high lunar orbit, and it'll stay there pretty much permanently. So essentially the way this will work is that we will have commercial entities that will be shuttling between low earth orbit, the earth, and to the lunar gateway. 
At the Lunar Gateway, then, there will be purpose-built craft that are landers, and they will shuttle from the Gateway to the lunar surface. Why this configuration? Because this is the optimal configuration for planetary exploration. We could do it a little more simply and perhaps a little less expensively if we just did it like Apollo. But why would we do it like we did it in the past? This is not about nostalgia and history. This is about practicing for the future. This is about getting it right for planetary exploration. And remember, we have a space-faring generation, and we owe it to them to continue to move beyond. So what does moving beyond look like? It looks like sending crews to Mars. The form of propulsion is still under debate right now. Whether it'll be chemical, whether it'll be nuclear, that will, there will be some active discussions that will continue with that. Right now, we're planning for chemical propulsion. But as we get to Mars, we're going to see a whole different way to explore that we will have developed these processes on the moon. And in order to understand this, you really have to go back to the future. So think back about 100 years and think back to the time of the golden age of polar exploration of our Earth. So it, um, it's, a, it's an interesting historical review. And if you look at some of the examples of successful polar explorations, those that were most successful were the ones that learned how to live off the land. So here in the UK, you should be highly proud of Ernest Shackleton and his incredible example of lunar south, southern pole exploring. Actually had trouble making it to the pole, got stuck in the ice and lost his ship, the Endurance, right? Was crushed in the ice. What's interesting is that being stuck there for a two year period, not a single person was lost. The entire group made it back. Why did this happen and why was it so safe in this regard? Well, Shackleton rejected the notion of pr previous British explorers. And instead of going to the, the manor houses and the parlors of the day to find people who might be willing to fund this project and come along, he said, you know, I'm gonna go to the docks. I'm gonna go to the pubs and I'm gonna find scrappy people, people who are used to living off the land. Shackleton was a little actually scrappy himself. His brother uh, is still implicated in the theft of the Irish crown jewel, something we forget about, right? And so he followed the model of Norwegian exploration. And so by living off the land, you can reduce the mission size. You're more comfortable with that, with that opportunity. In fact, that's what we'll do with Mars is we'll begin to live off the land. And it starts with entering Mars. Now Mars has an atmosphere. It's not a great atmosphere, as we'll see in a second, but it is an atmosphere nonetheless. If we dip a spacecraft into the Martian atmosphere, that atmospheric friction can slow it down just enough, regenerative braking, if you will, that we can begin to capture into a Martian orbit. It doesn't cost us anything in terms of energy, so it gets us there and makes us stop without a lot of fuel. So getting there is half the battle, stopping is the other half of the battle. And ultimately, putting down a small crew somewhere in the range of probably four to six, and you'll please make note on this particular image, it is properly annotated. So what does this look like? What does a Mars mission design look like? So, so this is referred to as a perihelic conjunctive design. And so what does that actually mean? So a perihelion means that Mars and Earth are really close, and if it is a conjunction class mission, basically what that means is that the, that the Sun and Mars are opposite each other relative to the Earth. Okay, so that's the, that's the opposition class. So how does this happen? We have these opportunities where Earth and Mars get pretty close to each other about every two years. So I'm giving you one example of one of the early flight profiles that was available for this, but we have about 30 years of opportunity that looks like this. So you take off from Earth, and it will take you, depending on the particular orbit and the particular type of vehicle that you're flying, six to nine months to get to the planet Mars. And then we'll land. Now, you have a choice at this point. What you can do is you can stay on the Martian surface for no more than 30 days, and it remains pretty energetically favorable to go back um, and, and get back to your vehicle and head back home. 
But gosh, it took a lot of effort to get there. Maybe a better alternative is to say, we're gonna stay on the Martian surface for nearly a full Martian year. So about a year and a half of an Earth year. And then what we're going to do is leave Mars and we arrive back to Earth. So approximately 30 months away from this planet. And that's our current design reference mission. That's how we're planning to go and explore Mars. So why is that a big deal? Well, if you think about it, we have been leaving this Earth for 58 years. Humans have been leaving this Earth ever since Yuri Gagarin's orbital launch. But during that time, we've never gone very far. So if you sort of think of it in this way and say, how long do our missions last? And how high do they go? How far are they away from the Earth? Well, we've done this. We go suborbital right now. So Virgin Galactic has, uh, will be doing this very shortly. And uh, Blue Origin does this on a regular basis now. SpaceX has moved past this. We, of course, have the ISS as well. We've been to the moon a few times. Of course, we haven't been back there for uh, 48 years now. So, but this really constitutes the known limits of life beyond this Earth. That's it. That's all we've done. If we want to go to some of the other fun places, things like asteroids or to Mars, Mars, depending on the exact configuration of the orbit, can be as much as a thousand times greater distance from the Earth than the Moon is from the Earth. So this is a big step up in planetary exploration. And again, we'll be heading out two and a half, three years for our Mars missions. So we really have to extend these known limits, extend our operating envelope far beyond what we have currently done. So this is, if you will, our next great unknown. And we've been hard at work at this, and we've been hard at work at this for decades. So what I've done for you here is I've summarized the entire totality of the human long duration space flight experience. So we've had now about 530 people who have gone to space in some shape, way, or form. I think I was number 338. But I've constrained this analysis to those people who have gone for a month or more in space. So at 16 days, I don't even make it on my own slide. But we've had about 270 individual experiences that have happened since the, the late uh, 19, actually early 1970s on this. So what happened is this. You'll notice that a lot of this is red. So that designates both uh, the USSR, which is the bulk of this, and then the Russian follow-on missions as well. You may remember that the United States and the Soviet Union were racing each other to the moon back in the 60s. So Russia, the or so Soviet Union actually built a rocket that was about the same size as our Saturn V, the, the N1 rocket. They launched it four times and every single one of them exploded, never made it to orbit. And so simple reason was they chose too complicated to design. The main uh, first, first stage had 30 engines. And so it was a plumbing nightmare. Saturn V had five engines. And so we built bigger engines and we got to the moon. But the Soviets were still active and they went into the space station business. So in a family of Salyut space stations, they extended their experience with long duration space flights. So accumulated so many of these. And then our experience was basically from three different space stations. Skylab, which we had in the 1970s, leftover Apollo hardware. Most of us think of Apollo with pride, but we forget the fact that the Apollo 18, 19, and 20 missions, which were originally planned, the hardware was built, were canceled by the United States Congress. Why? Save a little bit of money, kind of boring. We've already been to the moon. Why should we go again? And so we let the program go. We came back to the space station business in the mid-1990s, partnering with the Soviet Union and with Russia um, on the space station Mir, and then, of course, our international space station experience. But this is what it looks like. So as, as we go out in time of duration, we have fewer and fewer people. Most of our missions on the International Space Station have been about six months. 
We've got um, out past eight months here. We go a little bit longer. When we get to 300 days, there's a total of eight people who have been more than 300 days in space. Only one of them is from the United States, and that, of course, is Scott Kelly. Scott Kelly did not fly a year in space. He actually missed by a couple of weeks. It went 340 days, but we'll give it to him anyways. And then our next closest on this right here, that's Peggy Whitson right there. And then sitting below the pixel resolution of the screen, well, you can just barely pick it up at 15 months here. This is Valery Polyakov. So he's a, he's a Russian physician and cosmonaut, flew on the space station Mir in 95 and 96. So that's it. And we got to go all the way out to 30 months. So we have to extend way off of the slide here. And that is going to take some doing. So part of our goal right now is to expend, extend our operating knowledge of, of long duration spaceflight. I should point out this, that when we look at those that have flown with the US or as international partners, that um, 30 of those data points were generated in the past five years. And of those, a third of those, so 11 of those, are actually international partners, including your own Tim Peake. So he falls as number 80 on the list of extended duration, and he's out here right about, uh, he would be right about here at 185 days. So, so we're working quickly to do some catching up on our knowledge base. And that's why we need to continue with the International Space Station. But if we're heading for Mars, what do we worry about? What are the kinds of things that we are concerned about? And your answers will earn you patches. So let's hear from folks. Radiation. Radiation. So who said radiation? All right. So how about a, how about a Tim Peak patch for you? There you go. By the way, they're plastic backed. In our house, these make excellent coasters for your coffee table. <laughs> Anybody else? Radiation, good one to worry about. Neuropsychology and teaming. Teaming, okay. So as Yuri Romanenko said, take highly skilled people, put them in a vehicle together with very little to do. You have a perfect recipe for murder. <laughs> Anybody else? We have a few at the back here. Oxygen supply. You worry about, huh? Oxygen supply. Oh, we got to worry about oxygen. We'll do something about that. Yep. Yep. Anybody else? Water. Water. Yep. Let's worry about water. Low gravity? Sure. Long time with no gravity. Anybody else? Good answers. The amount of fuel needed for it. Let's get it from Mars. Public expenditure. Yep. And? Bone density. Very good. Say physical, mental health. physical mental health, absolutely. Envi Worth talking about. Environmental impact. Environment. Oh, geez, they keep coming. Yeah. Everybody's fishing for patches now. All right, we can do that. I think we've got, a, we've got a pretty good supply. Thanks to the good graces of the Physiological Society for sponsoring the patches for today. So we appreciate that very much, Bridget. So indeed, we'll worry about those kinds of things. But what is unique to Mars? as we think about this, are a couple items. So we have a different gravitational field. Mars is about 3 eighths that of Earth. It is a very hostile environment, as I'll show you in just a second. And when we're in a spacecraft, of course, it's closed. Radiation will be an environment that is unlike anything we experience on Earth, with the exception, perhaps, of nuclear explosions. So very, very energetic events. We are protected from those right now because Earth as a planet is alive. And when a planet is alive, that means that it has a liquid core and it has, it has ferrous material in it. So it generates a magnetic field. And that magnetic field creates the shield that protects us. And so that's why we can live on this Earth. But we, of course, will be isolated and confined. Imagine you on the surface of Mars, and that's what Earth looks like. Right? It's not even the pale blue dot anymore. It just looks like another object in the star field. And that's what we'll be experiencing. So the human challenges are a lot. And we could talk about these. This is an entire course worth of uh, activity here. I'm only going to focus on two and talk about the environment itself in honor of our meeting. And then we'll talk a little bit about the idea of bone. 
So what does the Martian environment look like? As we said, Mars has a, gra has a gravitational field that is much lower than Earth, so about 38% compared to Earth. It is also a very, very cold environment. So if you look at the average temperature of our planet, including all latitudes and all seasons and average that out, we're at about roughly 15, 16 degrees C planet-wide. That's our planet-wide average. Mars, minus 62 C. Much, much colder, very, very cold environment. And the reason for that is that it doesn't have much of a blanket to keep it warm. Our blanket is our atmosphere, right? We can define that by, if we just look at that, it's the barometric pressure, so sea level. Here we are, we're about 1,013 millibar. That's pretty typical for what we would say for sea level in the United States. And Mars, I didn't forget to put it there. It's just barely at the pixel resolution of the screen. It's about five to six millibar, very, very thin atmosphere. So once we lost, or once Mars lost the shield, because Mars is a dead planet, it doesn't have a moving core, it doesn't have magnetic protection, then its atmosphere is subject to the solar wind, and it strips off continuously, it's been going on for about four billion years, continues to strip off the ions of the atmosphere. So this is what we're left with, and that atmosphere is actually 95% carbon dioxide, so an absolutely toxic atmosphere, and then a little bit of inert material. If you compare that to here on Earth, we're about 79% nitrogen and inert material, almost all of that being nitrogen, 21% oxygen. And our amount of CO2, I would have said 30 or 40 years ago, I would have said 0.03%. Nowadays, I think I would say 0.04%. That's more reflective of the amount of CO2 we've accumulated here on Earth. So that's what we're dealing with in the Martian environment. But we're living off the land. And so what can we do? Well, here's what we can do with living off the land. We're gonna go looking for water. And you know what? It's not gonna be that hard to find. I'll convince you in a second. So this is the way we used to think about this about 15 years ago. So this is about 250 kilometers across. And we're gonna zero in on this particular crater right here. And that's what you're seeing over on the right-hand side of the screen. Now, we'd see these gullies and you'd see these rivulets, and we got kind of excited about these, and we said, gosh, this really looks like liquid is flowing on Mars. And our understanding at that time was to say, it happened pretty recently, and in geologic time, that means within the past 10,000 years or so. So what we've come to realize is that we got that totally wrong. Because now we have this global surveying presence of Mars, we can go back and visit sites again. And guess what? Sites like this are emerging on a regular basis. This is an active process that is occurring on Mars today. So we have things melting and refreezing. So we wanna go looking for ice. And in fact, we can find it. So here's an example, looking in 2008. This was a newly emerged crater. So if a crater pops up, we're gonna, we're gonna dust off a little bit of the Martian surface and lo and behold, look at all the water. Now this isn't much of a crater, right? So this crater is not even as wide as this room. It's just a little over a meter deep. This is a pretty small crater. So what happened by looking just a couple months later to all of the water, to all of the ice? Well, it's physical chemistry 101, isn't it? Right, when we think about the states of matter, remember we have solids that turn into liquids, we call that melting, and we have things going the other way, they freeze, or we condense or vaporize. But when we have conditions that are of low pressure and low temperature, we go directly from solid to gaseous form, and that's called sublimation. And indeed, we've already seen that Mars is low pressure and it is low temperature. And so that's what happens, is that the vapor sublimates, it recondenses at the poles or in other cold traps, and then you get things like this. This is Korolev Crater on the Martian surface. So these are the kinds of views that we're obtaining. This is actually was last fall that we obtained this, so this is less than a year old. 
This particular crater is 80 kilometers across. That's a pretty big crater. The volume of water ice and probably dry ice, liquid CO2, that exists in this crater is in the same family as one of the Great Lakes in the United States. Not the biggest, but certainly not the smallest either. So huge amount of water that is available. And it's, so it's in this form as well. And if you look up at the poles, you find it everywhere. So this is uh, quite an opportunity for us because now we've got water, we've got CO2, and what we can do is we can do chemistry. That's always an exciting thing. So let's do a little bit of chemistry. So let's take chemistry and we're gonna, we're gonna take water and we're gonna electrolyze it into its elemental forms, hydrogen and oxygen. Now that we've got some hydrogen, let's take that and react it with CO2 that we've harvested from the Martian atmosphere and we can make what? Methane, we can make methane. So methane is a pretty nice fuel in a lot of ways. You can run engines on it, you can burn it. And in fact, we'll see that Blue Origin is actually running their BE4 engine on, um, on hydrocarbons and SpaceX will be running their, rapid, their Raptor engine on methane as well. So you can, use, you can run rocket engines on it. And oh, by the way, as a byproduct, you get nice potable water to drink. So here we are using the resources of Mars. We're actually, we've got oxygen for breathing. We've got a fuel, we've got water to drink. This is pretty great. And the only missing part of this, the secret sauce is energy to make it all happen. So we should put tons and tons of solar arrays on Mars, bad idea. So we don't have nearly the lumens of density to get enough going. We think for a Mars base, we'll need about 50 kilowatts of power to do that. Best way to do that on the Martian surface is a small fission reactor. And so that's the technology that we're developing right now, actually coming out of the nuclear submarine industry. We've been doing small fission reactors for quite a while. So We've got some challenges though, as we start to look at the Martian environment. You've seen a little bit now the environment and the climate that you're dealing with, but Mars also has weather. And so here's Mars. This is last year, so looking at it, and this is early in the summer, and this is later in the summer. So you see this obscurity that's happening? That is because there is nearly a planetary sized dust storm that is occurring over Mars in last summer. So watch through these stacked images. This is actually from the Opportunity rover. And you'll notice this runs over. This is 100 days of summer, if you will. And so we start out pretty nice. And here we are pretty clear. Things dust up and basically they obscure completely. So what happens is that as these storms build up, velocity gets moving pretty quickly. And so it moves it around, we can get upwards of 200 kilometers per hour we can see for wind speeds. And it's enough to pick up this dust. This dust is really fine. The average diameter is about a micron and a half. Really, really fine stuff. And so it lofts up into the atmosphere and it'll stay up there even for as much as six months to two years we've been able to track the same dust particles in the Martian atmosphere. And it all comes from 1,000 kilometer long geological outcropping from one place that sits in the equatorial regions of Mars. And then of course, what it does is it blocks out the sun. That's why you see things redden up in midsummer here. Blocks it out so badly, that poor opportunity rover after being on Mars for 14 years and covering a little bit more than a marathon of distance could no longer charge its batteries. And so this lasted so long that essentially things wore out, we couldn't restart it again. And so last summer we had the death of the Opportunity rover, a mission that was originally planned for only 90 days and ran over 15 years. So a great credit to the people who designed that particular vehicle. So, We've got finer weather events that occur as well. So this is one of those images from the Opportunity rover, and this is a day on the life on Mars. This is about 2006, actually. And so what you're seeing are small tornadoes. Those are dust devils. 
So these don't occur during the dust storms. They actually occur afterwards as the surface starts to heat up a little bit again. And these are actually pretty handy. So the, one of the reasons that Spirit and Opportunity ran for as long as they did is because as these dust devils would run across the solar arrays, it would essentially fan out all the dust. Solar efficiency would go back up again, charge up the batteries, and away you go. So it was kind of an added benefit of using the resources of Mars. But nevertheless, I think you probably are convinced this is a fairly hostile environment, and we will need some form of protection. The easiest to do is an inflatable structure, which sounds sort of ridiculous, right? except for the fact that we have had for at least a decade inflatable spacecraft that have already been orbiting the planet Earth, and we have inflatable structures that are docked to the International Space Station now. So we have been practicing for these kinds of moments, and we've actually built up a pretty strong experience. Now, I said we talked a little bit about bone, and the key thing that we're worried about, this is one of our key human challenges, is osteoporosis. So on the left here, what I've shown you is trabecular bone or spongy bone. This is the kind that you would find in your vertebrae, maybe along the crests of your hips. And it's beautiful stuff, right? You have this nice lacy format. And if you notice these lines, they actually follow along the lines of stress of the bone. And on the right side, this is sick bone. So if you look for these areas, these are called trabeculae. In some areas, they're very thin. In other areas, they are broken. And then, of course, other areas, yet they're completely absent. And without doing too deep a dive on bone biology, I should summarize and say that we know that bone can remodel. We add to it and we reduce it all the time. Trabeculae will thick, thicken and thin, but when we lose them, when they drop away, they never come back. So there is a reversible nature to bone remodeling and an irreversible nature to bone remodeling, and that's why we have to address this. Why am I so concerned about it? Because spaceflight accelerates bone loss. Now, we've known this for a long period of time. This is our first space station. This is Skylab. So it flew in 1973, 1974. Um, what's neat about Skylab is that the three different crews that inhabited the vehicle during that time, they collected blood samples, and every time they went to the head, they collected a urine sample and fecal sample, and they returned all of those to the ground. Now, what's amazing about this is that they've been saved. So my colleague, Scott Smith, he's a nutritionist at NASA Johnson Space Center. He is also the curator of all astronaut urine and fecal samples since the dawn of the space program. And Scott did a very clever thing. What he did was 25 years after these samples were collected, we developed a new assay that was easy to do in urine that was a marker of bone breakdown, so n peptide it's called. And so he subjected, he thought out some of the Skylab samples, and he subjected them to an n peptide assay, and this is what he found. That things increased, increased, increased in urine, and then they sort of stabilized. So, okay, so this means that bone's breaking down, bone's breaking down, but then it stabilizes. And this is actually a really bad thing, because what this means is that this is an accelerating rate of bone demineralization that stays elevated throughout the flight. So the net result of that is that, on, on average, we lose bone from our skeleton. So many of you in this audience have probably had your bone scan. You've had a DEXA. This is what astronauts look like from several different published studies that we've done on this. So we'll start here at the bottom. And if you look at areas, essentially, let's break this down and say sort of below the heart and above the heart. Below the heart, you see these big losses. 1.5% per month, 1.6% per month up here in the hip. And then as we get towards the heart, not much happens. And as we get to the head, we actually see, and this is important, so I hadn't heard this mentioned in our meetings today, that there's actually an accretion of bone. Things go up. So if you've heard that astronauts come home with thick heads, yes, we have the evidence. This is true. So this is remodeling occurring. And you go, oh, big deal. These are single digits, right? 1%. Who cares about that? Well, just to put this in perspective, 
The people on earth that we worry about are postmenopausal women, right? Postmenopausal women generally lose bone at the rate of about 1% per year in these regions. So these are rates of bone demineralization. They're 10 to 15 times greater than what a postmenopausal woman experiences. So let's sort of put it together and let's say, okay, if we're looking at the hip and we're in space for about 30 months and we're losing our bone at about one and a half percent per month, over our time, if we're not able to stop that, we're gonna lose about 50% of our bone, 50%. And you go, well, Jim, that's not realistic, right? You've missed all the ways that we can stop this. Okay, sanity check. Is this biologically plausible? If we look at people who have been spinal cord injury and confined to bed for an average of nine years and compare them to ambulatory controls, they're in a similar ballpark. They have about 45% less bone. If you put this on the age charts, this means that potentially our Martian astronauts could return with the bone mineral density of an average 100 year old. They're actually off the charts, somewhere way out here where these points intersect. So this is something that we absolutely need to address. Now, does that mean that you're gonna die if you have low bone mineral? No, it doesn't mean that. So this chart is here to remind us that indeed, as bone mineral density goes down, your risk of fracturing something goes up. But there's another variable at play. It goes up as a function of age, okay? So younger people, their fracture risk doesn't go up very much. Older people, their fracture risk goes up a lot. Why? So it's not that they don't heal, it's true that they don't heal, but that doesn't explain this. It's because, so muscle mass, that's right. And all of this works together to say that old people fall, don't they? I'm getting pretty good with those. So old people fall. And so if you fall and you have low bone or mineral density, you fracture. And if you don't fall, you don't fracture as much. So this is really an interaction with a decline in muscle mass and changes in the vestibular system that are associated with the aging process. So in order to understand these problems, we have to move outside of just cells. We have to look at entire organisms and how systems interact, and that really is the nature of physiology and how it applies to medical practice. So what we don't know is really what this is gonna look like for our Martian astronauts. It will be dynamic. Probably we'll get to Mars and we'll say, you know what? You have to stay inside for a week until you get your Mars leg, get comfortable with that, that 3 eighths G. So we know people are gonna lose bone. We haven't yet mitigated it completely successfully, but we've got some strategies that are helping. So the worst case, which is what I've presented to you, is a pretty disturbing scenario, yet we can probably control that risk if we're smart about how we program people. So overall, here's the kind of occupational risks that we would see. If astronauts went to Mars, everybody would lose some bone, everybody. And maybe 40% of people would lose in the range of 50% of their bone mineral. If we look at exercise capacity as defined by maximal oxygen uptake, so 20% would have greater than 25% loss, and nearly half of people would have greater than 30% loss of muscle strength. And when I asked engineers and spacecraft designers, would you tolerate a reduction in your system performance by 30%, they say, of course not. That's completely unacceptable. Why in the world would we tolerate that for the human system, which is the most important element of our space exploration strategy. So we can't do that, so we must do better than this. So really, what's our, what's our key then for the future? Finding the right site, finding the place where we can land, where it's flat, where we've got reasonable dust control, and where we've got some water nearby. Demonstrating those technologies, how we can harvest water and we'll be, we'll be doing this on the lunar surface. And oh, by the way, we're doing this kind of thing on the International Space Station right now. How we can create 
methane from the Sabatier reaction. Extending our stay time from this time of weeks to months and now out to years, protecting from those physical hazards, and in particular, minimizing the physiological hazards. As we said, with bone, we could talk about the cardiovascular system, and of course, the radiation and the psychological stress that you all have identified. So with that, I will shamelessly fly the flag of my university from days when I was a younger person. But maybe it's better to leave you with this thought from the father of human spaceflight, Konstantin Silyovsky. And indeed, we are now a space-faring society. It is our job to get out of low Earth orbit and go on and explore beyond that. That is the task that we are setting forth for the next generation. And with that, I will thank you very much for your attention. I'd be happy to answer any questions that you might have.